Good evening, everyone. Greetings from Europe and thank you for joining today's event. I'm super excited to um, kick off today's uh, social impact panel uh, that will be moderated by uh, my very own Gustavanos, co-produced. Gustavanos is the co-founder of Ethelon. And without further ado, Gustavanos, please take it from here. Um, I will demote myself to sound engineer. And if you need anything, please let me know. One second to do one more technicality, Alexandra. Hey, hello everyone, how are you doing? Uh, greetings from New York. I hope you're doing great in Athens, Cyprus, Europe, New York, San Francisco, whenever you're connecting with. I'm super excited to host these events and welcome you all in Social Impact in Tech, the first event of the year for Greek tech community. Uh, so Tech for Social Good, today we're gonna see how how we can use actually tech in order to tack, tackle some of the toughest challenges in society, from healthcare to education to democracy or how we're breaking language barriers. Uh, all the previous last years, the R&D of big corporations have made emerging technologies more accessible. We can already see blockchain and digital identities support many social causes, how fintech solutions are supporting microloaning, and in general, how we can use tech in order to create scalable solutions and decline costs for those challenges. Uh, together today, we have four amazing speakers, four amazing personalities, four amazing human beings that they have created such an incredible impact. Uh, I will start with Alexandra. Alexandra is an international marketeer. She is leading the development and partnership of a social media, uh, social impact media company Good and worthy. She has worked with many Fortune 500 companies, but also with brands like UNICEF and one of my favorite, the Tom Sue's. There's great social cause behind this uh, product. Then we have Diana. Diana has an electrical computer engineer background. She's the founder of Unique Minds, which are supporting young students to find the right path from their life, and especially as they're joining the university. At the same time as a robotic instructor, she's one of the Olympic gold medal winners as she created with her team uh, a smart cone for, people with bl for blind people. Then we have Evie. Evie is a great example of how she used existing technology to scale her social impact. She's the founder of Worldwide Bodies and she's actually helping to raise open-minded and culturally aware little one children with her amazing books. And last but not least, uh, the guy, I'm really happy that most of them are women in this panel. Uh, that's a great success for, uh, for Greek tech. We have Yorgos, after a great career where he passed from LSE to Columbia and many other institutions and positions, he created 100 mentors where he empowers employees, students and employees to build better questions and find their why, mainly through mentoring. And every day he's supporting thousands of students and connect them with, with people from companies from NASA to Google and students from Greece to Zimbabwe to Hong Kong can answer some of their questions and find their directions. Uh, they're gonna describe better themselves. So, you know, I don't want to speak any longer. So do you want to tell us uh, your story? How did you start? How did you end up in this place? And Evie, you're the person next to me. So let's start with you. Perfect. So I think I'm the opposite example of when you have an idea, you should go for it. Worldwide Bodies has been brewing for over 12 years now. Um, I, I was always irritated by how we always um, feel that our way of life is the correct one or the normal one and that there's not enough resources out there to learn about different ways of life, especially when we're raising kids. Um, so I had this idea of creating like a, a series of stories, each story focusing on a different country and a different culture for children to learn about the world. I ended up working on Worldwide Bodies as part of my master's uh, thesis program. And at the same time, I was interning at Penguin Random House only to realize how archaic the publishing industries and how I wanted to start this. Tabled the idea for a couple of years and then finally decided to go for it. Serendipitously was talking to a friend, uh, telling her about it. She said, you know, I told her I have everything I need, but I can't draw to save my life. She's like, oh my God, you should talk to my sister. She's this amazing illustrator. 
Two days later, we meet, we say, okay, let's try to create the first book. I write a story, she illustrates it. We're like, let's print a thousand copies, see what happens. I think there and then that's how Worldwide Bodies was officially formed. Um, what we thought we would do initially was to create a, a book on each culture and do this subscription base and every month we do a new book, but we realized soon that bootstrapping a business, creating products, selling it and like creating so many products every couple of months wouldn't work. So uh, last year we decided to pivot and instead of creating a book on each culture, we said we should have one product that encompasses our mission. That's when we um, created a crowdfunding campaign for the Book of Cultures, which is a book that has 30 stories from different countries for children to learn about the world. And here's where we are today. Diana, feel free to continue. Thank you, Evie. That's wonderful. Diana, if you want, you can be the yeah, next one. Sorry. I wasn't sure that I'm the next one. Okay, so uh, for me, everything started uh, many years ago when I was about 12 years old. I had a very good teacher in the junior high school and he created the robotics club and I decided to participate. So we created a robotics team uh, called the Girl Power and we participated in the first national robotic competition and we won this competition. So we represented Greece in the World Robot Olympiad in Korea. And from that moment, and uh, so I, I, robotics is like an important part of my life. So I decided to study robotics. And I realized how important it is for a student to find this thing, this talent uh, outside of the, stay of the school curriculum. So for me, robotics wasn't uh, mathematics, physics, and all these subjects. It was something else, something that I had a chance to find because of a very good teacher. So when I went to university, I decided to, uh, to create a company, uh, an NGO called Unique Minds, in order to help more students in Greece to find what they really want to study. So from how it is to study law uh, to how it, how it is to study chemical engineering, we try to help every student around Greece to fill this gap between uh, the school and the university by providing academic orientation. Awesome. Yorgos, thank you, Diana. Yeah, I, th I think this is a great pass, actually, because uh, Diana's mission is, uh, and the unique minds are, uh, we're, we're in a common mission. So, uh, as always, the, the story goes back to our childhood. And uh, I, I was growing up in, uh, in Crete, and I, was, I grew up in Sitia, a town of 7,000 people. Then I went to Heraklion, larger city. And then I went to Athens to, to study at the capital. And uh, I had, in every stop, I had uh, certain mentors, let's say. I didn't realize at the time that there were mentors, role models that I would look upon. So I, I feel very lucky that in every stop, I, I, I had people around me that could act as role models. And uh, uh, this also continued to happen when I went to the US, I, from San Francisco to New York to Spain, to China, and every stop was uh, a milestone. And every stop, I, I had the chance to see a person that I admired and I was like, okay, I want to be this <laughs> in the next stop of my life. So the long story short, uh, I think I was very lucky. And uh, I was very lucky to have all those uh, mentors around me. And uh, we said, you know what? We need to uh, actually 100 mentors and the tipping point uh, are organizations that uh, pretty much uh, we have built what we want to have ourselves in the first place. And I think this applies to everybody's story, stories. And uh, uh, today we have uh, thousands of mentors uh, and we make it very easy for uh, mentees, no matter where they are, no matter whether they are in the most remote island in, in Greece, but also in a in a village in, in Zimbabwe to uh, make a question about what they want to be when they grow up. This is one of the things and get an answer from a personalized answer from a so-called mentor that they wouldn't be able to meet otherwise. And that's all from my side.
I think that leaves me. Um, thank you all for your patience. I've had a couple of technical difficulties uh, over here, but it wouldn't be 2021 if it didn't still have some of the, the tech woes of 2020. Um, I'm Alexandra. I am a Greek American on my mom's side, and I am Greek Cypriot on my baba's side. Um, and I kind of always like to say that I got my start um, from an early age. My baba is a geography professor. Um, so kind of growing up with that, um, with that exposure and with that worldview that he had, I think it really kind of started my global interest and my global career from a young age. Um, I kind of grew up really fascinated with, you know, how the, how the world order works, how interconnected countries are, and then kind of also how interconnected we are as human beings and individuals. I think over this last year, uh, the pandemic has really shown us just that, um, how, you know, how freedom of movement and how just like we can we can reach people on the top of a button. So um, in my day job, I actually work, um, as Gostapano said, um, in social impact consulting. I work for two awesome brands, Good and Upworthy. Um, and we really just focus on kind of creating campaigns that push the world forward. Um, we work with everyone from, you know, Netflix and the United Nations to Dick Sporting Goods. I am a really big believer in that, you know, no matter what industry you're actually working in, you can make a difference in someone's life. And ultimately, um, as cliche as it sounds, I think leave the world a better place. You don't just have to work um, for a nonprofit or kind of in that traditional impact space. Um, and so a lot of my past experience has been um, really varied. And I think I've had a lot of experiences that kind of helped me bring um, a holistic uh, lens and perspective to social impact. Um, Cosapanos mentioned, I've kind of over the last decade, I think, called about like seven cities home around the world, including my hometown um, of Akron. In Ohio, and I have um, a background in international relations and international development. Um, so that's kind of really been the anchor, I think, of my career, um, but also just really inspired me to kind of think um, outside of the box. And so I'll touch more on this later, but I think um, something that has been really cool for me um, in the last year, which um, you'll hear more about, and I think what kind of brought me here today is uh, the Greeks for Humanity Instagram page that I founded last summer. Um, it was created kind of off the back of the, the Black Lives Matter movement, and I was really just looking for ways to have um, anti-racism conversations in my Greek community that weren't in the circles that I already had. And so um, technology has played a huge role in that for me. Um, I think, um, as some of the other panelists have said, you know, whether you're sitting here where I am in New York City or in Zimbabwe, Australia, London, Lisbon, um, you can reach people at, at the touch of a, at the tap of a button. And I think that's such a beautiful thing about technology that it has um, that capacity to transcend borders. Um, and I think it just really gives you um, that much more runway to, to get your message out into the world. So grateful to be here today and excited to, to dig in more. That's awesome. Thank you very much, all of you, especially since you have such diverse stories, uh, finding your path in a younger age or later. Uh, I want to share something with the crowd. We have a QA and a uh, option in the Zoom. So if you have any questions, I can already see first questions coming. So please type them in the chat, type them in the Q&A part, and we'll answer them in the end of the event. But you know, please uh, let the questions flow as we proceed. So Diana, Yorgo, Sevi, Alexandra, you already mentioned you know, your story and I think uh, all of them incredible. Now I want to focus on how you are actually using technologies to scale your social impact. And Yorgo, so let's start with you on this. That's a cold call. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's actually uh, the topic of the discussion. So I, I think I have uh, a couple of things that I can, I can share. So. The first thing that I, I would like to, to share is that, um, f first of all, you, you have to have uh, very clear, clearly defined the mission uh, and the, the output, the outcome and the impact that you want to have before you apply technology. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, we, we are a technology venture, uh, but uh, if you haven't done your homework, um, you know, Technology is not a ma is not magic. I mean, uh, you use it in order to augment the solution that you have uh, that you are providing. So the one thing that I would uh, like to uh, somebody from the uh, from this room to, to keep would be this this note, and I, I put it in the very beginning. So, but what do we do uh, in terms of technology? First of all, you have 
you have uh, to make uh, the user experience intuitive. So on the front end side, uh, I think we have made a lot of iterations and we are putting our users in the center of our design, which is also another tip for uh, not only social venture um, entrepreneurs, but also uh, any kind of venture. Uh, put your user in the, in the center of your design and create the front end solution and a, uh, and a journey that is intuitive for your beneficiaries primarily and then everybody any other stakeholders so what we have done is that we have changed it i think it's four or five times you know the the main user experience i think once in a year i we changed uh, how mentees uh, enjoy mentoring and uh, primarily how they keep track of the journey uh, of, of their learning journeys. On the back end side, so that I close this uh, uh, answer, um, we, I think technology right now plays a very, very significant role because uh, we make uh, we have made our algorithm, matching algorithm between the, the question and the most relevant mentors uh, quite sophisticated. So uh, we make sure that the match is uh, according to the criteria that the user put. And the second thing that I'm most excited about is how we use uh, right now uh, big language models in order to uh, identify questions uh, that are wonderment questions, how uh, the users, how the mentees become better in terms of uh, being good listeners and inquirers and how you can actually measure that because technology is about that. I mean, again, your mission should be very well defined, but uh, technology will come and help you uh, augment the solution and measure the results and make it easy and visual to the users to realize the value of the impact that you are providing to the world. That's wonderful. Thank you. Diana? So um, in our case, we didn't uh, create a new technology. We use already existing technologies like platforms, uh, but the technology gave us the chance to increase our impact because we have uh, access to a school in Corfu, a school in Kavala. Uh, most of our events are based in Athens, which is the capital. Uh, so the students in Athens can uh, visit the universities, can visit us and learn information, but it was important for us to give the same quality and the same information to a school, a small school in a village, in a small town. So by using technology, and uh, I think that the pandemic situation helped all of us uh, to do that because we had to create more online events, uh, help us to uh, be in touch with the students, to understand their questions, to answer them, to match them with uh, students in the universities. So they really help us to have access, not to like, 10 schools, but 100 or 200 schools. So it's really important. Uh, and in terms of robotics, uh, I think that something that I find important is I am, as I am an educator and instructor in robotics, I always try to uh, educate my students so that they understand how connected the social impact with technology has to be. So technology should be a tool to create social uh, impact. And for me, uh, this robotic chain that uh, won this gold medal in the World Robot Olympiad uh, this year is like a huge lesson that technology can and should have a positive impact in our world. That's great. Alexandra, please. Awesome. Hey, whenever so you I... want, can unmute yourself. So I don't have to call each one of you each time. <laughs> Um, awesome. So in terms of, you know, technologies for sharing social impact, I think this is a really awesome question. I'll, I'll touch on the two ways that I use it um, in my day-to-day -day work side. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned, I work at Good and Upworthy. Uh, you may have seen us on Instagram, but What's been really cool for us, uh, we've been around from well before the pandemic, but during this time, I think we've really kind of owned a unique space on the internet where we're kind of serving as this lighthouse of positivity. And, you know, as you all know, and as we all feel on a day-to-day -day basis, the internet moves so fast. Um, sometimes, you know, you're chiming in on one thing, it's already behind, everyone's moving on to the next thing. And it can be really kind of hard to digest things in this way while we're all at home. And so what's been really, really cool is we've kind of 
created this safe space where we are telling positive news. We are elevating some of the best moments of humanity from around the world, whether that's, you know, little kids dancing with their parents at home, packages being delivered, all, all sorts of just like awesome human stories. And I think we've found that it's become a really great place for people to kind of have a moment to take for their mental health to really kind of just engage with the internet and in, in a positive way. And so truthfully, kind of that that day job that I have really inspired me last summer to launch the Greeks for Humanity page. Um, I was home in the Midwest at my parents and I was kind of just sitting outside on, on our patio and looking at the internet, seeing so many images around um, the death of George Floyd, around all of the, the protests in the United States, all of the anti-racism conversations that people were having here. And I was just really feeling that I wanted to kind of contribute to this conversation in a more tangible way. Obviously I was digesting and consuming so many resources, but I, I saw a gap um, that the Greek community, at least like kind of the, the Greek um, millennial, like our, our generation community wasn't really chiming in in this way. Um, and I think, you know, I saw a lot of like Greeks um, for black lives in terms of kind of sorority and fraternity networks in the United States, but I didn't really see um, this space. And so um, if you've listened to other things I've talked on, you'll hear me say this a lot, um, but this page has honestly surpassed my wildest dreams. I, I didn't really have any expectations. I truthfully thought that maybe it would have 10 followers, including my, you know, my family. Um, and um, an old friend actually found me in the early days, re introduced me to a, a great friend of hers and kind of the rest is history. Um, I work in really close partnership with an awesome um, Greek girl based out of Arizona. Her name is Alexia, um, and she kind of directs our community content. Everything that we do together is really participatory um, and collaborative. Um, and so I think that technology has truthfully been the reason that we've grown. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, obviously, tech kind of allows us to transcend borders to talk to people all over the world. And um, I know that if we had tried to create this Greek community um, in a previous world, like in my hometown here in New York, um, obviously there are a lot of those networks, but I think what's really beautiful is um, we were able to reach people everywhere and only technology um, can help us do that. And so obviously, you know, I think technology has kind of saved us in this pandemic year. Um, we're all navigating this really unique time in human history. We can't see people face to face. We're obviously sitting here on a Zoom panel, things that I would never would have used in my vocabulary even two years ago. Um, but I think kind of you know, just like us, all these tools are imperfect, but like some of the panelists have said, they're augmenting our lives. They're kind of helping us to keep going right now. Um, and so I think that it's been cool to see that because the internet has kind of helped us um, democratize content. It's helped create more equity. People who don't just live in a big city like me in New York um, can, can access and apply to jobs in different locations than where they live. And so I think that's been a really awesome thing. Obviously, all of this new world has its challenges, um, but I think that it's kind of really created a lot of opportunities for all of us to kind of pivot and create these new opportunities. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm just a big believer in the fact that it's allowed us to create new opportunities and kind of have this new beauty, beauty of like an indefinite reach that um, wouldn't have had the same effect and definitely wouldn't have manifested um, in the same way without technology. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful for, for all of these tools. Whenever you want, the stage is yours. Okay, so I guess because our product is not um, built on tech, uh, I'm going to talk about how you can use tech in all the other aspects of uh, running, building a project, running a business and whatnot. And I think I, I would actually say it's tech, there are so many technologies available for businesses now that the tricky part is not to like learn to use them, but to learn to choose amongst them and to use the ones that will work well for you rather than try to use all of them and like end up wasting time rather than using them towards your advantage. So I think one thing to note is that you should always, uh, when choosing technologies either for product development or for sales and scaling, is to see what other people in your industry are doing uh, because if they're using some technologies, they might have tested them. So probably they've done the legwork for you. Um, and secondly, where your audience is at, right? Um, so touching upon that, I'll talk about a few things we've done is A, even though we're not uh, a tech product, 
we have used technologies to help in our product development. Um, first ways, running a lot of surveys and talking to users in all parts of the world to understand what to uh, include in our products. And secondly, in terms of uh, product development and mostly manufacturing and sourcing to be able to um, talk to factories in different parts of the world and find suppliers that would actually be able to produce what we wanted at you know, the prices that we could afford, at the scale that we could work with, and so on. Um, from there, another way we've used technology to um, build brand awareness is even though, again, our products are physical, we have used a lot of our content to offer um, free digital activities to parents or to newsletter subscribers. Um, and in that way to also, you know, show them a part of what we're about, um, but also without spending any money, um, being able to gain that brand, uh, like build that brand trust amongst us. And it's actually interesting to see that many of the people that have used uh, the resources that we've provided for free are the people that will be returning customers and the names we'll see popping up again and again. Um, so I think you can definitely use technology to build brand loyalty and create, use the content and the expertise to have to give to people because um, education is super powerful. And I think people are appreciating more and more companies that are working towards providing an educational space for them beyond their products. And the last thing uh, I guess is with our Kickstarter campaign, um, we had an idea of this book, but we, we realized it was going to be a very big project. So we didn't want to go ahead unless we had the funds for it and we had the market validation for it. And we saw that Kickstarter A was a space where lots of children's books were being uh, funded. B, there were other companies who had similar products to us that used the platform successfully. So again, we got that, oh, okay, there's something here for us. And then from there, um, we realized that people going on Kickstarter and my customers on Kickstarter are people who care about a product that has a mission rather than just not lazy products, but products you won't like talk about or care about, you know, like, the, I don't know. Um, so we, we realized that we could find an audience there where they could say, oh my God, I care about this mission. Like, um, because there, they ha there's a platform with, um, that has audiences that are mission driven. Um, so yeah, again, like look for technologies that can work for you. Awesome. And I just want to mention that uh, Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform. So what Evie with her team did instead of having a traditional book, they first pitched the idea of creating all the graphics to Kickstarter, this crowdfunding platform. And people were donating like six and seven and eight months in advance or pre-ordering the book, six, seven, eight months in advance in order to collect all the funds and then launch the book for her. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for sharing the amazing things you do. Now you have 30 seconds to cop to paste your links of your initiatives in the chat in order for the audience to be able to find you. So, you know, organization, websites, Instagram page, whenever you want, Eva, Alexandra, Yorgos, and Diana, now it's your moment. Please copy paste them in the chat for the audience to know where to follow and find you and see more information about what you're doing. Uh, while writing the links, I just want to summarize that I think everything until now we heard started with a little bit of serendipity for the four of them to find the right, their passion or the people who inspire them could be a professor or a teacher or a, the sister of a friend, you know, to connect the dots for them. And that led to having an idea, an idea that, uh, and the four of them uh, moved to action. And in the action was really important as first step to think about the users and what the users wanted and needed and which was their actual you know, personality and how you could answer that need. And that was a moment after thinking the ideas, the action and the users that they use technology. And they use technology to either, first of all, to scale their impact outside of their local and existing circle but then to use it to identify even better solutions to ensure the quality, especially if they want to transfer to other locations that they were not physically, measure their impact and create a safe space for interaction between them, their initiatives and the users. Uh, so Evie, you said that you were looking about people of your network and what they were doing. So I know that the four of you are also, you know, 
trying to keep updated and you're looking a lot of what's happening in the world. So I want to ask you, what do you think now are the most promising threads in the sector and related to tech and social impact and the work you're doing? Uh, whenever, um, yeah. whoever wants. Can... Go, Evie. Got okay. <laughs> Uh, so I think um, even though the children's book publishing space has been heavily like monopolized the past years, you do see lots of smaller boutique firms popping up and creating fewer products that are focused on a specific mission. And I think that what that does is that um, it helps products that are, you know, created with more expertise. Um, Another trend which is very uh, fortunate for us is that um, there has been a huge surge in the need for diverse literature, diverse characters uh, in like more uh, proper representation of what's going on in the world. I remember when we first started, I was talking to one of the head of the big publishing houses and I told her my idea and she laughed and said, you don't understand diversity does not sell. Um, and I remember I, I thank God I'm, I'm I'm very stubborn, I don't listen to people around me, but a um, few months later, there was a study saying that there's only 1% of people in children's literature that uh, focus on black, Asian or ethnic minorities. And since then there was this huge surge in trying to create more products that um, have characters from different parts of the world. I think also what happened this summer um, accelerated that trend even further. And the last thing is that, even though thankfully physical books are still one of the main ways children read stories and ebooks aren't really replacing those, we do see companies coming in and creating technologies that facilitate physical book reading rather than replacing it. So we have like a company called Novel Effect where they have these soundscapes. If you have children, you should download it and like. Once you start reading a book, um, this soundscape gets activated and you listen to all these amazing sounds um, as if you're in the setting of the book. Um, so yeah, these are a few of the most promising trends in my mind. Thank you. Rihanna, Yoros, Alexandra, who wants to go next? I'm happy to hop in. Um, so I think, um, as I mentioned before, obviously there are quite a few trends we've touched on. Um, the internet really kind of democratizing access to information, um, people, you know, not having to just live in, in a major city and remote work and all of all of those things. I think a few other things that I'm really seeing and that have kind of tied into the work I'm currently doing, not only in my day-to-day -day job, but also through Greeks for Humanity, is that there is just a really, really big push um, as, as Evie was saying and others for diversity, inclusion and representation. I think obviously these are words we hear all the time. They're, they're pretty big buzzwords, um, but sometimes it's hard to know like what that actually means and how, that can act, how you can contribute to that in your direct job, role, community, all those things. So I've seen, you know, I think we've seen in the last year or so, um, and I really love this quote from Trevor Noah, who you've probably all heard of, has the awesome daily show and just really does an amazing job of um, distilling news into a really like easy to digest way. He said something to the effect of, you know, we, all of us as human beings in the societies we live in, we've opted into like social contracts. So we do a lot of these different things on the day to day for various reasons, but you know, in the last year, we've seen this ability to kind of create new systems, opt into new social contracts, and really finding a way to kind of create systems that actually work for people, I think, um, and, and are equitable for people. I think, you know, around the world, obviously, all of us here today, we're based in a lot of different places, but we've seen that a lot of systems do benefit specific groups of people, um, can make it really hard to get, you know, invitations at the table, all of that sort of thing. And so I think there's definitely this kind of new ethos and, and inspiration behind kind of building your own table. If, if there isn't, you know, a room or a table that you have um, that access to, like really unpacking that and seeing how to kind of invite in new voices, new perspectives, um, you know, people who can kind of really make those changes. I think also in the impact space, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, beneficiaries, people who are benefiting from work in all of these different communities. Um, but again, a lot of those voices aren't really in the room when some of these decisions are being made around them. And so I think there's been kind of a shift there. And, um, you know, finally, I think 
um, as, as we've all seen, and we obviously all kind of make um, purchasing decisions with our money, whether it's our, our, our hair care, makeup, clothing, like we say a lot with how we spend our dollars. And so as Gosabanos mentioned, um, I spent some of my early career working for, um, you know, brands that also had some sort of a give back model. And, and we see a lot of that across the board. I think it's cool. And it's definitely um, a trend that I think is here to stay and has really accelerated movement in the past years. But, you know, as consumers, we're kind of demanding that brands do better, that brands show up ethically, sustainably. Um, and I think the internet has really allowed us to kind of call brands um, on their on their stuff when they're not doing the right thing. And so, Obviously, none of this to say that brands are, are, are people because they're not, but I think it's people that make up the brands, all, all of us, uh, people that we know. And so people um, have the ability to make decisions and make better decisions. And so that's something that kind of uh, inspires me because I think that we can kind of collectively make those choices with how we spend our dollar. And then that can also extend to a, a, a greater collective impact together. Okay, so um, I think in my sector, three are the key words, uh, collaborations, um, personalized uh, solutions, and uh, cost-efficient solutions. So first of all, we're not now talking for a very good specialist that work alone. If you work on the field of robotics, uh, you have to collaborate with um, uh, mathematicians, with um, psychologists, with uh, doctors. So we're forming new terms like a uh, surgeon, for example, who is an engineer uh, aiming to help uh, surgeons during the surgery. So we have to uh, understand how we can work together in uh, to provide the best result in the society. Uh, the second is personalized. So now we have all of these machinery algorithms, data analysis, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, so we're trying to create more personalized solution in every case, in education, in uh, medicine. Uh, and the third, which I think is important, uh, what uh, is the trend now is to find solutions that are cost efficient for everyone to uh, afford. So when the technology rises at first, we saw many solutions very, very expensive. But now we see from educational robotics to surgical robotics more um, affordable solutions for everyone. And I think this is a very, very good trend that start to arise these days. Yeah, uh, again, Diana gives me a great pass because uh, uh, I think personalization and cost efficiency are uh, even more profound now uh, as you know what, what uh, beneficiaries but also stakeholders uh, request uh, so if I had to uh, if I can contribute to the discussion I, I would say that the main trend that I see is uh, that uh, pretty much what collects those items that Diana you Diana mentioned uh, and uh, make the 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 user experience speaking from a technology primarily side of uh, social of the social impact make it super uh, easy and intuitive for the user. Uh, and uh, there is a trend of elimination of, of noise, I would say, in terms of the user experience. Uh, let, let me, the, the one profound example, actually, Costapano, um, I have to share that with, uh, with the participants of this uh, uh, nice conversation that, you know, we found each other again in Clubhouse, right? So, Clubhouse is like the most characteristic example, uh, technology-wise, but we also found a lot of uh, social impact pioneers uh, there. And the reason why we uh, are all very enthusiastic about this new medium is that, uh, you know, the, the user experience and the, the proposition is one, and uh, it's, it's audio-based. You don't have all the noise of the 3,000 features of Facebook, for example. And you have uh, uh, you you go you go you narrow it down to the to the one proposition that is communicating in an authentic way with each other, which is in, at the heart of social impact as well. So uh, this is what I see also in many many programs, uh, social impact programs. And uh, I will just share one example that uh, impresses me a lot lately. Uh, we, we, we partner with uh, the Prince's Trust uh, in the UK, 
which is a very large organization. Uh, they have very sophisticated manuals and a lot of processes. It's a it's a Princess Charles uh, a trust uh, for mentoring in the UK and uh, the Commonwealth countries, and lately in Greece and other countries as well. And uh, they are very um, um, they are very knowledgeable about mentoring. And let me say that it's exactly uh, how Vienna you you said make it cost efficient, and I'm adding uh, super easy for the user. So. For certain programs that are in uh, areas in, in, in like rural areas in Jamaica or uh, in Africa, uh, the only medium they use for the mentoring, uh, uh, the, the, the mentoring, and this is how it starts, is it's WhatsApp, WhatsApp messages. So they narrow it down to the very, very basics. I see that as a trend, you know, people uh, become, you know, become friends with the fact that you just need to communicate your goal and your mission, no matter what the medium is. And uh, that's, that's the main trend that I see that we, uh, especially during COVID, COVID made us feel a bit comfortable about, you know, the, the clothes that we, we, we wear and the, and the media that we use. Amazing, so many notes. So actually you all mentioned about the value of collaboration and you know how this can lead to cost efficiency. And most of the times this happens through big corporations. So I want to ask you from your experience and your interactions and your until now work, how can non-impact focused companies can use their technology and their resources to create a social income in society, social impact in society? I know that many of you have collaborated with private companies. So either Alexandra or Diana, uh, feel free to start first with your cases. Uh, I can start if it's okay with you, Alexandra. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I can um, separate two different ways for these companies. The first is the directly way. So uh, a, a huge company or even a startup uh, can hire somebody um, to uh, have a, a to have an impact with that. For example, I work in a company uh, that is not a social impact company, but they decided that they want to provide students with uh, the skills they will need in the future, like coding, for example. So they hire somebody to do that. So I'm responsible for the whole project. So this is one way, but the other way is the indirectly one. So they can use their technology to provide, the, to provide it as a sponsorship, as a donation uh, through their CSR department to companies, small companies, uh, not only to help them uh, increase their impacts, but also to help them educate their employees because the education is really, really important. So you don't have uh, to change your vision or to change, uh, to change your focus, but you can use your technology for good by providing this technology to other startups or to other companies. I, um, I totally agree. Um, I um, similarly kind of as I as I mentioned earlier, I think no matter what you do, no matter what work you're doing, there is a way to make an impact. And so um, kind of in my in my consulting work, I work with companies to help do that, whether it's um, a variety of brands. We've worked with coffee brands like a Maxwell House, um, Amazon Sustainability with their Climate Pledge, um, HBO, Netflix, like amplifying, you know, documentaries and things around the environment that already exist. Um, and like Vienna said, like you can hire people who are already doing that work. So in the case of, of, of my companies, you know, like hiring someone to help you um, to, to have that kind of megaphone and to amplify the really good work you're already doing. I think it's always great to, you know, so many things kind of happen and then brands don't brag about it. So, you know, we're all out here, like not really knowing that things are happening. And so we're like, oh, you aren't doing enough. You aren't doing all these things, but then sometimes some really good work is being done and no one is telling that story. Um, and I think there's also another perspective where um, if you are a non-impact focus company say that's like not what you do day to day you, you um, build cars or computers or something really tangible like who knows what it is you do um, there's a way to kind of craft a social impact strategy from the ground up um, as you know as opposed to coming to um, a company with assets you've already created with videos with a campaign like you've already done all the thinking you can then bring people in to help you do that thinking and to kind of be your advisors and so that's a lot of work um, that I currently do 
Um, right now I'm working with um, an architecture company that's based in New York, but has offices all over the world. Um, and I am definitely no architect, but through this experience has been really eye-opening for me to see, obviously we're all working in, um, some of us more so than others, I'd include myself in this, some more cramped, tighter spaces. We're spending a ton of time at home. Um, as you see right now, I'm getting some sunlight through this window. Other times, you know, we're on Zoom calls at, at night and then we're trying to get all these lights going. It's been really interesting to learn kind of how, you know, a company like an architecture firm can have a role to play in wellness, equity, um, you know, overall well-being of the people who live in buildings um, and how they can actually give back to communities and make people's lives better and more meaningful from just really constructing initiatives and building structures, things that actually like have us in mind. Um, it's been interesting to also see, for example, um, making buildings as accessible as they can be. Um, and they like to use the analogy of like, instead of adding, you know, a wheelchair ramp, for example, after a building has been created, and it's kind of an afterthought, again, kind of reversing that thinking and really like thinking about your end users, who you want to benefit from these spaces from, from day one. And so I think that's definitely a place where a lot of brands, companies, people can use support. Maybe they're thinking of impact as something that they add on after something is already baked and it's done and dusted. But I think we're seeing this kind of switch in our thinking and our ideology around, hey, I really need to be thinking about people first and foremost and making it kind of, um, you know, really focused on their needs um, and their, their dreams, desires, how this is actually going to benefit them from the beginning. And so it's been really kind of cool to see that take shape because um, you can do that whether or not you're building cars or whether or not you are a nonprofit. I think there's a large kind of spectrum there and you can kind of um, intersect yourself, your company, your passion and purpose at, at any point along the way. Thank you, but yours and Evan, you want to add something more to everything I've been said? Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, sorry, Evie, go ahead. <laughs> Evie, Evie, please don't, don't, I don't want to lick my gentleman uh, badge. No, I was, I, I, I all had like very similar things to say, but I think uh, one thing to add is that whatever work you're doing, you, you should think that no matter which industry you're working in, whether it's fintech, ad tech, or whatnot, there's always a social impact in the work you're doing, right? Um, there's always an impact somewhere, um, either good or bad. So I think no matter what industry you're in, you should always be thinking about how your work in no matter what industry it is, can uh, be shaped to improve even the smallest things um, in that sector or in a specific uh, group of the population, whether it's, you know, like if you're creating a product, you can see how you can create a variation of that product that can help people that are more underprivileged or underserved communities and how it can make those small tweaks in your products to open it up so that um, it uh, has a further positive impact and it can reach more people and so on. So I think we should start thinking as if every company in the world has a social impact and every company and every person working should be thinking, how is my work impacting and how can it even make like 0.1% difference and improve the world? Go on, Yorvas. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that, because it's exactly the point where I, I would like to, um, to contribute to the discussion is that uh, right now, um, you know, actually, these are tips about how you go to big companies to uh, as, as a social venture uh, to uh, to cooperate with them. So right now, every company, uh, almost all companies, along with uh, uh, ROI, like uh, return on investment, they have uh, SROI, social return on investment. Uh, and it's very obvious, uh, and actually I saw that I, there was, I think, in the last Davos uh, um, conference, where uh, they showed a, a research that uh, showcased exactly that there is a very, very strong correlation between SROI and profitability of companies. So it's in the best uh, motivation, interest of uh, companies, even if they are cynical, let's put it that way, to to be good citizens. And all companies, exactly as you guys put it, as you, uh, Evie also uh, shared with us, they have missions 
and you have to find those missions and be very uh, bold about asking them when you go to them, what is your impact? And reverse engineering, what is your outcome? Uh, reverse engineering, what is your output? And let's do it together because I have the medium to do it. Of course, it, it's going to be a company which is in your industry, let's put it that way. So uh, 2020 for us, it was like the year to go and do this exact thing. Uh, we have uh, like three uh, global contracts with uh, Ernst & Young, with, uh, with uh, McKinsey, PwC, with such firms, because we saw what are the central pillars of those companies. Uh, uh, for example, PwC right now has digital skills. We have the same pillar and uh, we have to merge powers and you come and have this amazing uh, capacity in terms of people, consultants that are like experts in that field. And we have mentees on the other side. Go, let's, let's connect the mentors and the mentees on, the, on, the, on that side. And of course, many other uh, much more capacity that you wouldn't find otherwise in, in social ventures uh, like, like us. So again, uh, for, the, for the people that are uh, social venture entrepreneurs or they belong to a team, I, I do, do your homework, do your research, and uh, uh, just add data to the, your social uh, ventures and uh, missions. Uh, don't, don't just go because we, we are doing good. I mean, uh, the intentions are always good, but guys, let's, uh, let's put some data up front and uh, make it a real, a real deal. That's wonderful, thank you. And in addition to what you said about Davos and SROI, uh, I think now with the digital world we're living in, how companies uh, have to become more transparent, actually, because of the audience. Uh, they're speaking a lot about the ESGs and the stakeholders' economy, that the companies not care only about their stakeholders. I know one Stas Samadis is in the audience from this, uh, the Global Cyprus Group. He's also really passionate about it. So companies now, they have to think, even if they're architecture or fintech, as you said, about their role in society. And it was actually the chairman of BlackRock who in his last year or this year later, I'm not sure. Uh, BlackRock is one of the biggest financial asset holdings companies in the world that said, if a company doesn't play a role in society, doesn't add value to society, they don't have a reason to exist. And this translated exactly what you said. So it's either directly running and creating their own programs, which is wonderful, or indirectly by supporting and providing this technology to other people who are working on those causes, uh, wonderful things can happen. And I say this from personal experience as in case of Ethelon Carriera.gr, the career site in Greece provided us all their technology in order for us to make more effective the connection between volunteers and nonprofits in Greece. And we really appreciate them and we could all see the impact afterwards. So, Evie, Alexandra, Yoros, and Diana, uh, and before we proceed with the questions from the audience, I want you to say your one piece of advice to someone who wants to start their own social impact initiative. So what would gonna that be? Your one piece of advice. I can start with this um, if no one else wants to pop in. Um, so I can definitely be a walking cliche. I, you know, I love my good share of quotes. And I think just like dur during these really like trying times, I, I won't use the word unprecedented because we've heard that all so much. And if you're like me, I, I think we're sick of it at this point, but I'll say one piece of underrated advice that I've really just come to appreciate, especially in this last year. Um, and it's going to sound super cliche, but bear with me is to, to be yourself. And I think there's a lot to that, but to me, that's really meaning to, to own who you are, to own what you are, whether it's your identity, your passions, your purpose. I think, you know, in social media and just in the kind of space that we all operate in on a day to day, um, things can feel really fast moving. It feels like there can be a ton of comparison, proof points, you know, we're getting caught up in what everyone else out there is doing. And I think it, it's awesome on the one hand that everything is so instantaneous, but then on the other, it can, you know, make us start to doubt ourselves. Everything feels um, like, you know, everyone out there is accomplishing all this much more than you. They're more experienced, accomplished, just like, and the list goes on. But I think that the truth of the matter is, and, and someone told me this once, no, literally no one else in this world, there are so many of us walking this, this earth, but no one is 
like you. And so no one has your unique point of view, your own life experience. And so I think it's really empowering to just kind of figure out whether it's like sitting down with a notebook and some of the quiet times of our lives now, but, you know, just sit down and figure out what moves you, like what, what sorts of things inspire you and excite you? What sort of, you know, capabilities do you bring to the table? Um, I've had to answer that question a couple of times throughout my job hunting journey. And I think it sounds a little bit weird. Like, what do you mean? What are my capabilities? But I think so many times we look at things from a, um, a weaknesses standpoint, we look at things like that we need to improve, but we don't actually sit down and say, Hey, Hey, what are my strengths? So how can I how can I advocate for myself um, from more of a strength based approach? And so I think it's really exciting to actually kind of have that conversation with yourself, um, figure out what those are and how you can kind of bring your story to life in your own way. Because I think you know no one else can tell that for you. There are so many people telling stories on behalf of people, communities, groups. But I think when you can connect on your with your own self on that um, and, and align that with your purpose and innovation and tech and all these amazing things, um, it'll make you unstoppable. And I think, you know, from my own experience, believing in yourself and selling yourself, we, we get asked a lot. And I think maybe a um, a question for this panel too, like um, in some of our earlier iterations was around, um, you know, how to, how to sell people on your idea. And there, there's a lot of that. I think um, what's important to start is to actually sell yourself on your idea, to sell yourself on who you are, how much you bring to the table. I think that's literally step one, because before you can kind of go out into the world and sell yourself and that message to anyone else, it's important to ask yourself if you believe in that story. And I think kind of sitting with it until you do, and you're ready to tell that can be, um, can be definitely intimidating, but I think also really exciting because you have just such a such a unique thing and, and a, again, not to sound cliche, but just like a gift to offer. You have a unique set of ideas and um, the, the world deserves to hear them. So I would just encourage you to really own that. It definitely takes time. I think I've done a lot more introspection in this last year, probably in the pandemic than maybe the last five years combined. <laughs> but I think kind of doing that and doing some of that harder work and conversation will just make whatever you end up bringing to market, whether it's like you landing your dream job, you launching, you know, this awesome app that you've been mulling over for five years, like whatever, whatever it might be, just start somewhere and just realize that um, you're, you're awesome and, and you can do it um, and just start kind of speaking that way to yourself. And I think it'll be really exciting to kind of see what comes your way. Um, let me know if you, if you start doing that. And I think you'll be really pleasantly surprised at kind of what, um, what sorts of things start to come in your path. So. So I will agree with Alexandra. <laughs> uh, for me, it is really important to, to define the values that you want to have your mission, your vision, uh, to promote your work, um, you will need uh, stories and numbers. So regarding the stories, the first story will be your why, why you started. So in terms of sustainability, you are going to be asked many times, okay, it's a good idea, but how are you going to earn money? How are you going to have profit from, from this? I think it's important to, yes, of course, have profit, of course, be sustainable, but stay focused to your motivation and to your first goal. Uh, and I will give a very small example. Now we're going to product our smart cane. Um, so one of the first things that we discussed with uh, the company that is going to product this uh, cane was the cost. So we wanted to be sure that our vision that every blind person can have access to this cane will be true. So we discussed how much are we going to solve the final product. So I think this is important for me, define the values and stay focused to the values you had. Um, I think for me, it, it will be a combination of uh, advice, but also a plea. Um, I think uh, there's so many talented uh, and ambitious people that I talk to and you know like they want to start um, a new idea or they have a they want to you know start a company and they will have this you know urge to like um, help or they have an idea on how they can improve the world but then they also say you know but that's charity work I'm gonna focus on like making money uh, in the profit making business in a profit making industry I'm gonna start a company that where I can raise venture capital uh, where you can you know get a unicorn idea out of I'm going to do that for 20 years 
And then when I make enough money, I'm going to stop working and I'm going to work for charity. And I think that's such a toxic way of looking at work and not understanding that we are we all have um, a responsibility towards the world to spend our most productive years to work on the things we care about. Because it's not a, money is not in industries where they're not like, you know, social good industries. Money is there because that's where all the talent goes. Money is there because that's where like all the work goes. But if we slowly start adopting this concept of we should all be working for causes we care about, we should all be working on things that will improve the world rather than on things that will make us money, then investor, this will send a signal to investors and they'll start investing in these uh, ideas. This will send in a signal to the market and to customers and to users and there will be way more awesome products and services out there that uh, are working towards a collective, the collective good, right? So um, I think what I would like to say is uh, to like the people listening is that like we should stop this thing, making these distinctions of work that can make money and work that can do good. Like it's up to us to create work around companies that do good. It's up to us to put in the work, to put in the hours, to create a world with companies that are focused on social good and if we all do that then you know all all the world will follow towards that path right um so yeah that's one my one piece of advice slash plea so what what a great piece of advice ivy that's i feel anything else that i can say after what you all like added to to, to this uh, question is uh, a, a bit narrow. So I will do the, my narrow uh, contribution. Uh, the, the piece of advice is something that I wished I, I had given myself when, when we started. It's start earlier than, than, than you think, basically. So start with uh, a basic MVP. Uh, exa exactly uh, as uh, Diana put it, because you know your why, uh, your mission, and it's probably the only thing that doesn't change along the years, uh, but your how and your what are gonna change so many times, especially your what. So basically, if you don't start early, you are iterating your idea with your own self and maybe some you know, comfort zone <laughs> peers or like-minded people. But usually, uh, you know, you have to, to, to test it out and uh, test it out even on a, on a piece of paper or uh, like right, right now we have uh, the technology uh, uh, pillar of, of our, of our um, discussion. So even without, you know, what we call technology, test it out in the analogical world. Uh, well, what is it different to digital? Yes, to, to, to the physical space. So... Uh, you have to test it out with the basic MVP and, you know, being a perfectionist that I hear a lot of times is not, is not a good excuse, let me say, because many, a lot of people just say, I, I need to have this and that. And no, narrow it down to the sole proposition of the need that you want to, the problem that you want to solve. Uh, what is your one solution? Go out, test it out and uh, early on. And uh, your beneficiaries are gonna show you, put your exactly as we said before, the users in the in the center of your design process, and uh, they are gonna tell you how you will uh, provide them the solution that you are thinking the best way. That's wonderful, and don't forget that we create solutions for people, but also with people. So the earlier we test it and discuss it with them, the, the most valuable the feedback we'll have in order to proceed in the right direction. Uh, thank you. George, since you mentioned the last advice, there is also uh, a question for you. Which is the best advice you have received personally from all this mentoring? So you want to answer this as well? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. OK. Uh... If it was a different advice of what he gave. Yeah, basically, I, I had this advice a lot of times. As I said, uh, I, 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 am, I, I was the recipient of, of this advice that I, I gave you. But uh, I think the, the main thing is uh, um, 
is is a you know a merge of, of what also Evie said, for example, and this start early that um, it, it's it, the, the, there is no um, ideal condition. Let's let's put the, that that way. You, the, you will never have ideal conditions to uh, start uh, something that burns inside because. This is what we're talking about. Uh, we, we talk about problems that we, most of the times we had ourselves and this is why it burns it's inside. When, when it burns inside, no matter what is going on in the world, you're, you're gonna try it even with uh, the less of the resources that you might need to. So go test it out. I mean, this was the, <laughs> the piece of advice that I shared, but. Uh, be authentic about your mission and uh, make sure that you have a clear mission uh, before you, you test everything. And this okay. was the, the, the piece of advice that I, I had because all the time I was, I'm, I'm so visionary and uh, all this stuff, but when the simple question comes to place, hey, Yorgo, what, sorry, the beep, are you doing there? Because mentoring, okay, mentoring. That's amazing. And actually, this is, this is a very nice uh, question. What is mentoring? Uh, what is the role of a mentor? And there, you have to decide what, what you are. I can share what it is, but I don't want to <laughs> spend all the time on that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I will invite more people uh, from the audience. So uh, the next question is from Anastatis Stamatis. So Anastatis, uh, please join us if you want. With or without camera, it's up to you. Right, so uh, your question. Yeah, hello everyone. Very interesting uh, points of view. Thank you so much for this. So my question is about adopting new technologies in uh, like our social impact endeavors and the new technologies sometimes do come with uh, uncertainty, with risks. Uh, how is it gonna play out? Is it gonna backfire perhaps? Especially if it's something brand new that has not been used extensively before. So having in mind that uh, you guys are all working in like, the social impact uh, sector, uh, where things might even be a little bit less flexible, how do you go about managing this risk uh, when implementing new technologies? Um, I think, as I said, there's, you know, there are always so many technologies out there and that sometimes it's more risky to try adopting them before knowing their impact, right? So um, I would say you should always um, spend some time to test them, understand what you want to gain from these technologies, you know, have down, like write down your assumption, like what do you want to gain from that? Um, many companies also thankfully now will offer, you know, one month free trials, which is something we've done a lot. Um, write down the scope of how will this technology help you, write down your assumptions, what do you want to gain out of it, test it, put some time to test it, and then see what the results are before you go on and implement it full. Um, that's one way you could mitigate the risk there. I'll pop in as well. I'll echo what um, Abby is saying. I think that obviously there's there's so many so many technologies that are out there. I think some of the panelists earlier mentioned things like Clubhouse, which if I'm honest, I still don't 100% understand how it works and haven't dabbled in that yet, but might be on my horizon. But I think it, it is important. There are so many different things and tools and kind of what she spoke on in terms of trials. I think kind of like dipping a toe into some of these things before all of a sudden like launching head on. I think just also, you know, being realistic about the resources that you do have, the time and energy, how you want to show up as your best self on them and what that's going to look like. For the case of Greeks for Humanity, um, I have really chosen to stay on the Instagram lane. It's one of the tools that I know how, if, if we're talking like tech fluency, it's one of the tools that I've used the most over the last decade of my of my life and career. Um, I obviously, you know, there's the Facebooks of the world, LinkedIn's, Twitter's, Snap, all, just so many platforms out there. But I think um, figuring out, you know, 
what one is going to work best for you to, to, to use and then also reach the people that you'd like to reach. Um, and then when you kind of start branching out on others, for example, we're also doing a podcast. And so I've, I've used some new tools there um, and I'm learning how to upload that to places like Spotify and, and sound all these different places. I think just really, you know, you, you can kind of use them as you'd like, but you kind of are your best advisor there. I think you could totally hop on the bandwagon and, you know, use 15, 20 new different things, but I would say that that might not get you to where you're trying to go long term. I think if you really show up consistently and kind of choose a select a smattering of tools that are really going to kind of be your go to's, you know how to use them, you know how they work, you've learned kind of their capabilities. I think that'll kind of get you um, get you to where you'd ultimately like to go. Diana, I know you mentioned a lot about emerging technology and robotics. So do you think that be something of this can answer Anastasia's question as well about the risks of working with those technologies? Yeah, I think that- And maybe also been... outside of your uh, initiative, you know, from your general knowledge. Uh, I actually think that the most important is the education. Try to be as well as well as informed as you can. Um, so it's good that most of the technologies are open source, you have access, you have other users in the world that already tested, you can see some of the results. Um, as Evie said, try to see, try, try to, to understand what you want to take from each of, the, of these uh, platforms, of these technology tools, uh, and have a plan B for me. So in many cases, you tried something and you realize that it wasn't for you or uh, it didn't meet your needs, so have a plan B always. Uh, it doesn't have to be a tech solution plan B, but have a plan B so that you can be, you, can, you will be ready for, you know, an unfortunate event. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Anastasis, thank you for your question. I'm going to invite Christos Kritikos because he also has a really interesting question, especially of what we said about the how can startups and other companies have a social impact in society? Yes, hello, thank you. Hello, Christo, welcome. <laughs> Mario, Tijinete. Long time indeed. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the event and all the very interesting uh, information and discussion. So my question is, impact is usually a long-term game. I mean, uh, with some of those impact initiatives, it may take years to move the needle, right? And now you have a startup and some startups will not even last a year or two. How do you reconcile the longer timeline on the impact uh, uh, goals with the more immediate short-term needs of a startup? Yorgos, I know you started your own startup before focusing more social. So do you want to take this one? And yeah, I'll, I'll try to point. give something uh, valuable to, to this amazing question. Uh, Christo, this is uh, indeed, the, uh, I, I did that not, not to answer it, actually. I was like, bang, this is like the billion, the million dollar question. <laughs> so let me, let me share that um, uh, we have been struggling, like, for the last four years, five years to, to uh, answer this question. And uh, my two cents are that, you know, usually you start, uh, you have to define, as we said, and repeatedly enough, uh, your uh, impact, your outcome, and your output. In the first years of the startup, you are addressing the output uh, section of the equation. Uh, the output for us, for example, in a mentoring platform is uh, engagement, both sides engagement. So you have to justify that you have made it, as we said before, extremely easy, intuitive for the users. And uh, pretty much the numbers that you are showcasing uh, to the world are about the output. But this doesn't get you far. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. So you need to have defined the outcome. So this is the trigger point uh, and the impact that, for example, I, I think it's a good example. Mentoring is a good example because there are so many organizations and ventures that do mentoring, but they put the outcome way far away for, from the mentoring itself. 
Uh, so the outcome, for example, for uh, many programs that we work with, uh, I, I mentioned the Prisons Trust, and actually they shared this concern, the, the concern is employability of the, of, the, of the beneficiaries. And our take is that, you know, if you have to wait, which is, which is uh, uh, we honor this uh, outcome, don't get me wrong, but you have to wait six or 12 months to get uh, an outcome and to see whether your program works. And another problem is that in the meantime, you don't have, you cannot claim causality between the program and the, and the outcome because there are so many other factors that intervene between the end of the program and the outcome that you can, there is a light correlation, I would say, between the, the, these uh, facts. So you have to uh, put a lot of effort to uh, put the theory on front. And actually what, what, we, what we did, uh, which is, I mean, it's not uh, rocket science, but we said, you know what, you have to define what the role of the mentor is, as we said before, this very question. So a mentor is about enlightening the questions that you have and not giving answers. Many times we confuse it with the teacher. So uh, if the, the role of the mentor is to give you, to enlighten you in terms of your questions, your why, as Diana put it, and your mission, so you need to put an outcome that has to do with this very thing. And what we put lately is that instead of having an outcome that is about employability or uh, yeah, you getting a job, going to the university, feel conscious. How do you measure consciousness? You, you go and say, we went and, and we said, you know what? Our outcome is whether we increase the inquiry capacity of the mentees. So what we measure right now is uh, the score of the questions of the mentees and whether they score better in terms of uh, whether their questions to their mentors are better. Uh, so... We, we measure something that is way shorter term and is very, I would say, highly correlated or causality <laughs> correlated with, to, 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 the output, to, the, to the output, to the engagement that they had with the mentor. Essentially, the, mentor, the mentors empower the mentees to uh, become better listeners and inquirers. But back to our point, Christo, uh, and then you, you can measure the impact, the impact of the better a listener and inquirer, a more conscious um, inquire, a more conscious mentee, is that they feel satisfaction, they feel committed to their purposes. If they are employees, they, they perform better and they, the, the, the company, for example, has a lower churn rate. And this is the impact side. So you have to define output, which has to do about the, the status is engaged. The outcome is conscious for us and the impact is happy. So you have to make it to put theory in front and have defined so clearly your mission so that you, uh, as a startup, for in our case, we, we, we brought the outcome way uh, closer to our programs. And uh, I think this is a strenuous process for any startup. And it took us five years to realize that, which helped a lot. Let me say we, we, we quadrupled our revenues in 2020 because of this very simple, uh, uh, very simple um, clarification. Great. I don't know if anyone else of the panelists wants to add something to that, but I think your answer was perfect. Otherwise, I will invite Angie for her question, and I will ask George to type his answer in one, in one more question we receive in the chat. Uh, Mr. Kritikos, thank you. Being here, Angie, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, hello. Um, yeah, well, my main question here is because we focus a lot during the talk about the social impact of the startups, but actually in order to create a company, a startup, an NGO or organization, there are a lot of struggles in the beginning that are not related to the product or to the vision itself, but more or less are um, just operational support, accounting support, uh, governmental, legal issues, all this kind of stuff. So for people who would like to, who have a vision and would like to start something new, is there any advice 
uh, where we could seek uh, for help? Where did you seek for help? In which countries you started operating in the beginning? So at least we have an idea how we can move forward and actually bring our ideas to reality. Well, it's a rephrasing of my question. Hello. Uh, sure, I can go. Um, I think um, it's it's always very tricky to start. And I think like one of the big problems when you have an idea is that you think it's it's going to be a make or break thing. You know, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to launch tomorrow. Like, I need to make sure that support is set up. Like, the whole world is watching. It's going to say, you know, we're going to press the button and we'll either make it or break it in three days. Um, and it's it's actually never like that. You know, like, you, you'll probably won't make it or break it for a long time and it's going to be a very long process of just like very very small steps and I think that's how you should be thinking of it and that's how it makes it more manageable right so you I want every child in the world to be reading literature with like uh, heroes from diverse backgrounds right uh, first step let's write the first story let's see if we can get it in front of 500 people Let's print it. Let's see if we can sell those 500, 1,000 copies. Okay, we did. What's next? Um, okay, let's email all these people to see what they thought about. They responded. What else would they like to see? Okay, interesting. Um, some people are asking whether it's in bookshops or not. Okay, let's uh, try to go to some bookshops to see if they would take it up. So it's, I mean, I can go on for a long time, but you, you should be thinking of it as any any project you know you're like you're building a new house you're like moving to a new country anything right you're starting a new day you should think of your great idea you should have it as your north star keep it there but not don't try to think of how will i reach my north star every day then start creating like very 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 small milestones and spend your day thinking, okay, how do I go from A to B? Then how do I go from B to C? And how do I go from C to D? Then you'll probably go back to A at some point, you have to go to B again, oh no, like this way, that way. But I mean, I think the point is that you should keep your ideas your North Star, but your day to day should be um, treated as you treat anything else in your life one step at a time, one task at a time, what needs to be done in the next few days, in the next month, and so on. And hopefully it will make it a bit more manageable. I love um, what Evie said there. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think like so many times people, um, including myself in this, like almost don't do a lot of things because like we're looking at that full staircase, like we're really overwhelmed by the whole journey. And I, I couldn't agree more. Like having that North star is the best thing to, to anchor you and to kind of always remind you what you're working toward. But I think we've seen in the pandemic and I'm someone who's never really operated this way, but like, you know, when, when you look at trying to make five-year plans, 10-year plans, like the only thing that you can really plan is like right here, right now and taking that first step. And so I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that and, and to, to look at, what what steps can you take in like the the present the present right now to get you closer towards that goal I think there's also you know we, we've seen that um it's it's okay to ask for help like there are a lot of we're not alone in everything that we're going through I think the pandemic has shown us that too we're all kind of in very similar boats in in a lot of different places around the world and it, it's cool to see that there there is a lot of literature out there for you to to, to read and review um in my impact consulting I, we do a lot of landscape reviews for clients so we're really just like trying to get up to speed as fast as we can to become like an expert in any one area and I can't speak to you know Greece particularly on the ground, but I think that there are some amazing free resources out there. Um, I've taken some courses on Coursera, um, a really awesome website. There's also some like pay subscriptions that you can do, but there's so many classes on there where you can hear um, about what other people are doing in a field, what other, how other people maybe have addressed some of these business challenges. I think just like getting, getting smart on understanding what other people out there are doing. And I think in terms of, um, your kind of note around, you know, um, support from, from others. I think if there's anything that all of this technology has taught me, it's that reaching out to other people who are working on, you know, working on things who might want to get involved in what you're doing. You might want to get involved 
with them. Like I'm, I'm the product and I have so many relationships that have been introduced to me through friends, friends of friends. And so I think just start using the tools you have around you to, to connect yourself and to just kind of start tuning into the things that you'd like to, to be doing. And I think that all of those, all of those sort of short term, um, projects and steps um, will really kind of help get you to where you're trying to go in the longer the longer run obviously not to say any of this will come without its challenges but I think you'll be surprised to see how other people maybe have navigated it and, and they can they can help you on your journey as well wonderful thank you Diana I know you're was your typing so Diana I know you started an organization in Greece well, so in if, if 30 not everyone seconds your advice reply, it's okay <laughs> of course I don't need a reply to all. It was more of an open uh, question, just uh, in terms of uh, timing. Also, I'm not sure how much time we still have left. I know. Um, I can give 30 seconds to the Anna, though, because I know she launched an organization in Greece, which was part of your question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, so uh, once you have your why, as I said before, you may not know exactly how are you going to uh, to solve all the problems you have found, but you have your why. So I have to mention that in Greece, you have a lot of bureaucracy to take care. You have a lot of uh, un uh, uncertainty, but uh, a good first step is to go to many of the events that they're organizing to educate yourself about the challenges, about the problems. But maybe more important than the education you get through the, this event is the people you meet there. So the network you build, because in Greece, uh, the network really, really helps to develop your idea and to create your idea. Um, one very good advice I got uh, when we started our NGO was uh, uh, they asked me why you don't start. You have your idea, why you don't start? And uh, after a little hour, I understand that it was the fear of failure. So in Greece, we have developed this stereotype that, and if it fails, how are we going to survive if, if this idea doesn't work? So I think that uh, it's good to find a good team to support in the beginning, so you don't have to be alone in this whole journey. So for me, find a good network, find good people to support you, and everything else will come. I think you just spoke in my heart. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. All of you, uh, thank you, Anzi, for your question. Evie, Alexandra, Yoros, Diana, thank you for the wonderful conversation. I want to invite Mario to answer Kiki's questions about how everyone can access the previous Greek Tech events and present us the next topic that will be next month. Mario, the stage is yours. Evie, Alexandra, Hi. Yoros, Diana, thank you once again. Guys, what, what, what a great panel uh, I've been. Um, and Gostabano, th thanks a lot for moderating, being on the board. I mean, social impacts in your wheelhouse, we all know that. Um, Ethelon, of course, uh, one of the largest volunteering platforms in Greece. Um, so the question, right? So we have a question here. So Gigi's great panel. How they can access previous events, recordings, and which will be the next one? Okay, so on YouTube, right, on our Greek Tech channel, I'll upload this one tonight, once I get a chance, once it's over. We, we actually spilled over to like um, 90 minutes instead of 60, uh, because it was a great discussion. Um, so yeah, YouTube, uh, follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, we post a lot of content there too. Um, as for our next event, uh, FinTech, Financial Technologies, um, we have four great founders uh, on our panel, 24th of March, Wednesday, 4 p.m., save the date, uh, founder of Norblock, Plum, uh, Viva Wallet, and Nova Credit. So um, come join us. Uh, we're looking forward to having you again. Thanks a lot to everyone that joined. Um, we actually decided to organize these events a little earlier during the day, so it's a little more friendly uh, for participants in Greece. And um, Angie, um, I know you had some questions and Gustavanos brought you up. Once you launch your project, I would love to see what you're doing and see if we can help um, somehow. That's what we do at Greek Tech. We, we, we try and help uh, everyone's project somehow through our platform. So, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Great, thanks, guys. Thank you. Good for night. Thank you good so night, much. Thank you Bye. so much. Have a good one. We'll see you soon. Good night. Take Bye. Care. Bye.
Good job. No, it's not everyone here. <laughs> people are still missing. <laughs> people are still leaving. Yeah. Great. Should closing we... the room. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>